Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on Corporate Strategy, Combining Renewables with Enhanced Energy Efficiency. My name is Berenice Lomla, and I'm an event director at Green Power Global. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to welcome so many listeners to this afternoon's webinar. We have received over 450 registrations, which is a great testament to the excellent speakers we have participating and the importance of the subject area. So please be aware that this session is being recorded and a link will be emailed to you shortly after the webinar is complete. So you will be able to listen again and share with your colleagues if you wish. Just to let you know a bit about Green Power Global, it was founded in 2003 to accelerate the fight against climate change through creating live events. So these are commercial events that focus on connecting senior level decision makers. Together, we accelerate projects, we spread best practice and direct strategic decisions. Today's webinar is held ahead of the Corp <clears throat> of Corporate Energy Series Europe to be held at the Inter Intercontinental um, Hotel uh, in Paris on the 21st and 22nd of May. So the event will gather corporates and industrials, renewable energy project developers, utilities, banks, law and advisory firms to discuss the challenges and the opportunities of the sourcing and procuring of renewable electricity. Companies like Google, Telefonica, uh, BT, Vodafone have already confirmed their participation. So please do visit corporateenergyseries.eu.com for more information. Which brings me to today's webinar on corporate strategy combining renewables with enhanced energy efficiency. Companies such as Google, IKEA, Toyota and the Lego Group are not only leaders in their own sector, but also in terms of corporate sustainable sustainability strategy. So environmental sustainability is becoming an increasingly important part of corporate strategy, both for climate and economic reasons. Reducing GHG emissions is a global challenge in which energy plays a central role as our current society is heavily reliant on fossil fuels. While renewable energy adoption is a core focus for corporate environmental strategies, energy efficiency remains a major solution to save energy and reduce costs and emissions. The International Energy Agency estimates that energy use per unit of economic output in the industrial sector fell by nearly 20% between 2000 and 2016. So this is driven by financial and policy incentives through the modernization of installation and the application of energy management systems. Technology improvements enable industrials and corporates to better monitor their energy consumption and identify opportunities for energy saving and efficiency. Not only does energy efficiency enable businesses to limit their GAG emissions, it also improves productivity and therefore makes financial sense. Over the next hour, we'll explore the following questions around corporate energy efficiency. What are the benefits and challenges of increased efficiency for your overall CSR strategy? What are the latest energy efficiency technology solutions? How can your organization further reduce its GHG emissions through improved energy efficiency? <clears throat> I feel extremely privileged to welcome three excellent speakers this afternoon to address this topic. So firstly, we welcome Mark Chadwick. Mark is the Chief Executive Officer of ECOACT UK. ECOACT is an international consultancy and project developer helping businesses and organizations succeed in their climate ambitions. Simplifying the challenges and complexities involved, they help businesses deliver sustainable business solutions for a low-carbon world. We are then joined by Emma Mooney, who is Energy Strategy and Innovation Advisor at EM3. EM3 offer a unique service to allow industrial energy users take control of their energy spend through using data and their expertise and experience to produce energy metrics to monitor and manage businesses' energy. Finally, we are joined by Hannes McNulty. Hannes is the chair of the United Nations Economic Commission for, Europe's <clears throat> for Europe, or UNECE, Task Force on Industrial Energy Efficiency, and is also the vice chair of the UNECE Group of Experts on Energy Efficiency. UNECE is one of the five regional commissions under the jurisdiction of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. 
It was established in order to promote economic cooperation and integration amongst its member states. Each of those three speakers will take five to ten minutes to present their views, following which we will take questions from our listeners. <clears throat> you can submit your questions via Twitter using hashtag CES Europe or using the question box on the GoToWebinar bar to the right of your screen. So please don't be shy, we'll try and get through as many relevant questions as possible in this hour time frame. And with that, I shall now hand over to our first speaker, Mark Chadwick. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bernice. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to uh, quickly uh, introduce what I'm going to cover over the next five to ten minutes. Uh, my plan is to cover two topics. Uh, firstly, to have a look at some of the key energy trends that we have picked up from our most recent annual research. I'll introduce that uh, in, in just a moment. And uh, secondly, to have a look at uh, some of the work done by one of our key long-term clients um, in how they have addressed the energy transition challenge. So hopefully through those two topics, we should have a good understanding of uh, what some of the leading corporates are, are doing. Great, so moving on. So each year uh, for the last eight, nine years, uh, EcoAct have carried out a detailed survey about the sustainability and uh, energy and carbon performance of the FTSE 100 initially, and we've broadened that research out over the years to cover uh, IBEX 35, so the largest 35 Spanish companies, the CAC 40, so the largest 40 French listed companies, and last year, the Dow 30, so the 30 largest US companies. So we assessed their performance across a range of criteria, uh, 79 in, in, in this most recent uh, survey, looking at a range of things such as how effective uh, the strategy of the organization is with respect to sustainability, uh, to things like how effectively an organization is reducing their energy and greenhouse gas emissions. So that now covers 205 organizations from a pretty diverse range of sectors and a fairly diverse range of countries. So it gives us a broad base from which to draw conclusions. What I have pulled out here for you is a little uh, snapshot of the improvement in, energy, in renewable energy usage across the IBEX 35 and FTSE 100 between 2016 and 2018. So you can see uh, there's a real trend towards increasing renewable energy usage, and this is a combination of uh, self-generation renewable energy and also purchased renewable energy using uh, high-quality instruments. And our research shows us that, uh, without doubt, energy, uh, renewable energy usage across large corporates has mainstreamed. So any organization who isn't currently incorporating renewable energy into their energy mix and strategy is in a little bit of an uncomfortable and small minority. So there really is a momentum and a growing momentum around this topic area and very much worth exploring the renewable energy supply for your organization if it isn't something that you are already addressing. Looking at uh, FTSE 100 in particular, we can see the same sort of pattern here. Um, this is a two-year snapshot, so 2017 to 2018 we see that we've gone from 65% of uh, FTSE 100 companies making use of renewable energy now to 75%. So as we said, absolutely mainstreamed. This is an increase across both those companies who are self-generating and those uh, organizations who are buying renewable energy. So it's quite broad based in nature. What was also interesting for us is that for the first time, 12 different industries that we survey had scored all of the available points that we have for renewable energy. So, they, so that means in our estimation, they were doing all the things that they ought to be doing. And perhaps most interestingly for me is that within those 12 industries were a number of industries that are quote unquote uh, heavy energy consumers. So for example, chemicals sector, energy, water and multiple utility sector, industrial transportation and mining were all sectors out of the FTSE 100 where all of the companies had scored fully. What we infer from this information is that market forces and particular competition within industries appears to be driving behavior. So 
the, the this seems to us the best explanation for why every participant in an industry would be uh, participating fully in, in renewable energy. And so clearly companies do not want to be left behind in this. So again, for drawing lessons to broader participants, I think it's worth having a look around your competitive set if you're not already making use of renewable energy and communicating around that. Have a look at what your competition are doing and see whether it makes sense for you to do, uh, start to incorporate renewable energy into your strategy. So that's a, a very quick uh, snapshot of our research. For anybody who wants to read more about the research, uh, when the post webinar email comes around, we will include in there a link to, uh, to our most recent research and therefore you can feel free to come on to our website, download it and have a look at more detail yourself. So jumping into the case study that I mentioned at the beginning of the session, the organization we are going to take a look at is RBS. Um, what you'll see as we go through this uh, short section is tackling energy transition isn't just about renewable energy. It also requires careful planning and thought around energy productivity as well. At RBS, they are uh, tackling both sides of the energy transition very effectively. And so what we'll now do is have a look at what they've achieved and how they've set about um, this program. For those of you who don't know RBS, and I'm guessing most UK based people will know, um, they're a large and multinational financial services company, primarily based in the UK, but with international operations as well. Uh, most well known for operating retail banks, such as Royal Bank of Scotland and NatWest. The challenge for organizations like RBS is they have a very broad portfolio of properties, and they tend to be in mixed estate, uh, they can be a mix of small and large offices, branches in a variety of different buildings and environments, uh, large data centers, and other ancillary processing uh, buildings. So that uh, mixed and diverse range of buildings gives them a challenge with respect to energy management. And so therefore, tackling that challenge requires innovative um, approaches. So. First of all, it starts with ambition. And an organization like uh, RBS has been uh, managing energy and carbon for quite a long time. They took a look at their performance and set themselves some pretty ambitious targets. So the first target to, to think about really is a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. And that is from a 2014 baseline. So a fairly short period of time to deliver very serious uh, carbon reductions. The reason that they have such aggressive targets is they work very hard to align their targets with climate science, um, very much driven by the momentum around the Paris Agreement and building the eternal uh, will to take on an aggressive target like that. And really with an aim to uh, deliver reductions of a scale to keep temperature rises below two degrees. Maybe before we talk about the how did they do this, I think it's worth just briefly talking about why they do this. And so when you think about building the business case for energy productivity, that's quite clear and is very much underpinned by significant cost savings. So that's really the, the, the theory behind the energy productivity piece, and that's clear. But for renewable energy, this was driven by a desire to show leadership and to really demonstrate to stakeholders, both inside and outside of the bank, that the issue of carbon emissions was something that they took very seriously. So their program then uh, began by uh, thinking about energy uh, consumption and how to reduce it and therefore how to save cost. And in order to do that, it was fairly clear that we needed to improve data and reporting accuracy. And so we commenced, uh, along with the bank, a fairly large and wide ranging uh, smart meter rollout, which gave us high quality data from which to make decisions. It's very hard to manage energy uh, productivity without the underlying data from which to, to make a, an informed choice about what to do next. But the data in and itself doesn't really allow you to do anything. You actually need to have a good, strong engagement with your internal and external stakeholders who will take the insights and actually turn them into tangible on the ground activity. So the solution then really was, as the title says, an innovative partnership. 
So the ECOACT team, uh, working alongside the um, RBS team, went into a fairly detailed um, imp system implementation. So we put in place a cutting edge software system that on an uh, annual, um, sorry, on a day by day basis, reading data from half hourly meters, is able to analyze that data using some very clever algorithms to work out which buildings are consuming more energy than they should. And our team who are working on site with RBS are then able to pick up those energy wastage reports, uh, work with the facilities management teams and the BMS teams and other stakeholders inside the business to get involved and, and, and solve those problems. So that can be things like uh, upgrading BMS systems. So we've uh, collectively with RBS um, updated significantly more than 100 BMS systems, which at the point of time when we put together the case study for RBS, which is about 11 months into the, the contract with them, but already delivered savings of about 18%. Um, so very, very significant savings. Other areas we were able to identify through the system and the, the an analytics um, allowed us to improve data center performance by approximately 9%, which again results in fairly significant savings. Uh, we've also in, got in, uh, hands dirty and carried out quite a few uh, actual detailed investment grade energy surveys, again directed by where the system told us that the maximum savings benefits could be found. That is alongside the decarbonization of electricity. So this involves uh, sourcing renewable energy from the energy supplier, making sure that the uh, guarantees of origin are solid and are properly managed and retired. And building on that, RBS have now make and taken the next step to uh, pledge to hit 100% renewable electricity across global operations and have made that commitment to RE100. So it's quite a broad ranging um, energy program that tackles, as I said before, decarbonization and energy productivity. So let's have a look now at what the results and the impact of that would be. And again, to stress, this is based on the first 11 months of our operation. We're now coming up to the end of the second year. And uh, so many of these savings we'll talk about are actually a subset of, of what we have actually been able to achieve across the two year period. So looking at the uh, investment in the technology and the embedded team, so that's really the innovative partnership we talked about. So in the first 11 months, we delivered approximately two and a half million pounds worth of savings and cost avoidance, which we're really pleased about. It's uh, it probably, if we're honest, exceeded our expectations. Um, and you know, very often when you start a program like this, it's easy to take the low hanging fruit, uh, and much harder to continue to deliver savings but I am pleased to report that we've delivered even more savings in the second year. So the low hanging fruit is definitely still available. Um, very significant, almost two million pounds of saving in bill validation cost avoidance and reducing energy consumption by uh, somewhere around a quarter. So some of the carbon target numbers you see in the graph there are delivered by energy efficiency and some of them are delivered by, re by the renewable energy element. But the point is that both sides of the strategy are working really effectively. Um, worth having a look at and keeping your eye open for RBS's upcoming um, reports and filings because you'll see uh, some interesting news about how they've been able to hit or reach their 2020 target early. So really very proud of the collaboration we have with them and uh, congratulate them on amazing achievements. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for this presentation. It was really interesting to have this case study. Um, so now I will hand over to our second speaker, um, Emma Mooney. So Emma, I'm going to give you the comments now, and you should be able to present your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma Mooney. Um, I've been working in the sustainable energy and energy efficiency field since about 2000 and the last two years with a company called EM3. Um, okay, can you change the slide, please? Thank you. Uh, just a little bit about us. We're an, an energy consultancy focused mainly on the industrial energy sector. We do a full suite of energy services, project management, energy management, renewables. 
and our approach is mainly database science backed up with expert utility and process engineering. We have a very pragmatic approach to delivering um, real sustainable solutions and we have a team of about 31 but we're growing and we're all very passionate about energy efficiency. Here are just some of our clients. Uh, we work within um, Ireland, the EU and the US and some other global um, locations as well. So when I was thinking about this topic, um, I thought something that would be interesting, a topic that I thought would be interesting, and it's interesting because it follows from Mark's talk where he talks about improving engagement on both internal and inter external stakeholders and having data and the interpretation. This, I think, is perhaps a step beyond or parallel to that. Um, um, it is an in a topic that I think is of interest and important, it's both relevant to renewable energy and energy efficiency. And it's how to capture and uh, keep the knowledge value of your investment. And that will lead to sustainable savings from your energy efficiency and your renewable energy projects. Uh, I first came across this myself when I was, I was doing a thesis um, where even the best solutions were only as strong as the data that you put in. And that data is derived from both the knowledge of both the technology and the methodologies and the site processes themselves. Here uh, you can see a traditional kind of approach to capital projects in the energy field where on the capital project side, uh, on the left, you have the brief, which is informed by the operation side, that's the facility. Um, the design, which again is an, has some input from the operation side, the build, then you have the commission and the handover. On the operation side, you have design input, build input, you get training and handover. And then the capital project people implementing it often leave and the operation is left over to the operation side. That's fine, but what happens if there is change that occurs after the handover? Um, processes and industrial processes, as most of you know, uh, evolve over time. Very few stay rigid for long periods, and this can lead to a lot of problems. There can be changes in the process parameters, and if there is a that requires a change to the technology, if you don't understand the technology and its interaction with the process, that can lead to problems. A change of personnel can be a huge loss uh, within the utility sector and the energy sector. Loss of knowledge about how the technology or the process operates can lead to losses in efficiency. Changes in priorities of the site where the solution is no longer seen as relevant or as important to the site and the priorities of the site. And then the loss of knowledge, both explicit and tacit. Tacit knowledge is one of those uh, hard to define things, but it's the little nuggets of knowledge we often don't even know that we have but that are vital to the efficient running of a plant. When some of these or all of these change, it can lead to efficiency creep, where you get a very slow, small change, loss of efficiency over time, which can lead to reductions in savings, not achieving the return on investment, a loss of reliability of the plant, which can be very detrimental, an increase in risk, where the original solution isn't any longer fit for purpose, and a really important one in terms of renewable and new technologies is the reputation loss of the project and of similar projects afterwards, which can lead to difficulties then in securing finance for projects at a later stage. So when we look at overcoming the problem, and I don't think that there is any perfect solution. From my own experience, there are a lot of people who tell you that there is one solution and they know exactly how to solve a problem within energy, I think there are many solutions and you have to find one that is optimal for you and for your site. But some of the suggestions of helming it are to record everything and keep sufficient detailed record on site operations. I think this is a difficult one to do, but maybe it will work for some people. There's increasing the on-site energy team where you have sufficient backup, so when anything changes, there's always someone here that knows what's going on. Or there's the creation of a collaborative partnership approach with an energy services company, something like this, which is the model that EM3 is applying and that we have been applying for a number of years um, in our large industrial sites. So our solution um, is that we have a team of external experts who are all energy engineers. Um, and we have a very collaborative uh, approach with our partnerships. We are part of our clients' energy team. We, we're not sitting on the outside. We don't consult to them. We work with them. Um, we work with, with our, our company's system for data collection, so we don't sell any product, we just take their data, and we're not, but we're not um, an automated service. So every bit of information or advice we get and give back to the client has a human touch backed up by data and experience. We have weekly reports that we give to the client and virtual roundtable meetings every week. There are regular site visits so that we know exactly when we're talking about part of the plant, we know 
what's going on there in the park side that it is. And a very important part is that our team rotates as well. We have three people at least on any one site at any time. And those people rotate over time. So if someone is on holidays or sick or all sorts of things happen, there are always people within our team who know what's going on in the site. We have a very strong focus on monitoring and verification of savings. Um, and this is very important to us, as we have seen with other um, organizations where they will go in and implement a project. Um, they will say that the savings will be there, but a year or two later, there's no real monitoring or verification going on. And as I said earlier, processes change. It's very hard sometimes to work out what is the actual saving that this project has done, what are the benefits that it has delivered to our organization. Um, because it is a collaborative approach, EM3, we're invested in delivering and maintaining the savings with our clients. It's not a one-saw. So the benefits of this type of approach, and I suppose I'm not saying that you have to use EM3, but this is a good approach, I think, to address the problem. The benefits are, obviously, there's energy savings. These are monitored and verified. Um, there is focused on specific energy projects. It's not one size fits all. You look at the optimal performance of a project for the site itself. There is reduced risk because the parameters are very well known by the client, by ourselves, and by the, the um, installers of the equipment or solution. There's a support team on site who are viewed as part of the on-site team. And there's no data or um, information silo. So no one person holds all of the information on the site on the best performance of the site. Um, this is, might not sound like a big issue, but in sites where you have maybe one or two people working on energy performance um, and on energy, and one of those people leaves, an awful lot of data can be left, or can leave with them, sorry. Our goals are aligned uh, with, there's us, the energy performance consultants, there's the client, and then there's the client management, because often we find that the energy services team in a site can have um, their management team that they need to report to as well, so they're all aligned. Um, the staff motivation, this works both from our point of view, in that our staff are motivated, they have a very interesting uh, space to work in, but also that they're, um, for the site itself, there are lots of positive results and good news stories, um, which is very important. There are also a lot of non-energy benefits that I don't have here that are just as important with regard to resources, increased capacity, and things like that. Uh, slide. Yeah. So the key point, I suppose, that I'd like to make is that to ensure continued energy savings from efficiency or renewable energy, there's a need to invest in knowledge management and retention. Doing this will maximize the benefit of your investment. It will avoid um, efficiency slip, and it will lead to more informed and less risky investment in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma. It was very interesting as well. Um, great presentation. And so now I'll hand over to our last speaker, um, Hannes McNulty. Hannes, I'm just going to give you the comments now, and you should be able to um, change the slides now. Hello, thank you very much, and I, yes, I can change the slides. So, um, thanks for the opportunity to, to take part in the webinar, it's much appreciated. Um, as mentioned, I'm Hannes McNulty, and I'm a co-chair of the UNECE Industrial Energy Efficiency Task Force, and I'm actually also an independent consultant, and I work a lot with uh, another UN agency called UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, uh, focusing on industrial energy efficiency as well. So um, a lot to do with the UN and all focused on industrial energy efficiency. Um, as you can see from the title of my presentation, the focus here really is uh, the need to consider energy efficiency before or at least in parallel to considering other sustainable energy such as renewable energy. The idea being really save before you change. Um, it's better to reduce energy consumption before you change your source. So this is a little bit of an uh, overarching um, driver um, behind this uh, presentation. Now what I want to do is primarily talk about one of the key challenges facing overall uptake of energy efficiency, of, uh, let's say, within industry, and also to detail two projects that I'm doing with both UNEC and UNIDO to try and address this particular challenge. So firstly, um, 
I just, yeah. Firstly, in relation to energy efficiency, the fact is we are actually already doing a lot. I mean, as demonstrated both by Mark and Emma, there's a lot happening out there, whether it's with different companies, consultancies, we are very engaged on the topic. How yet we talk about the issue, the issue of uptake. The fact is we have identified many times over the different potential that's available to us. We do a lot of research about the barriers. We already have a great uh, approach to energy efficiency in the form of energy management systems. However, the harsh reality is we just are not managing to achieve widespread implementation uh, within industry. And what we mean by this is projects that are happening on the ground, regardless whether it's changing light bulbs or motors, or any other type of energy efficiency behavior change, implementation is still remaining quite slow. Now, we say that the key reason for this is, aside from all the many different barriers that have been identified, one of the key reasons here is we have a large number of different communication gaps uh, on the topic of industrial energy efficiency due to the fact that we have many different stakeholders involved in this conversation. We have companies in the industry sectors. These companies range from services to manufacturing. They can be tier one companies. They can be the supply chain. There's a whole SMEs. There's just so many different types of companies. We have many different types of supporting organizations that could be an NGO, a nonprofit, an international organization providing different types of support programs to these different types of companies. We have all the different policymakers from around the world, from different countries, all taking different uh, approaches on legislation, regulation, etc. And what happens is, is ultimately, energy efficiency is not so much difficult, just extremely complicated. People talk about it in different ways. People provide different commitments, targets. And if you take, ultimately, the company, the industry, they are nearly overwhelmed by the different sources of information, the different forms of help and assistance, and the different regulations that are out there. So it's an extremely complicated uh, topic, not helped by all what we call the different communication gaps. Now, if we talk about the different stakeholders and the way it is most more often than not, what I'm showing here on the right is the engagement that happens between, let's say, policymakers and industry. This engagement, when a policymaker wants to develop new energy efficiency policy and they want to talk to industry, they typically talk to the corporate management, the top level guys, who ultimately are not involved in actually implementing projects. Um, as a result, when we have a discussion between uh, policymaker and industry, the actual policy end user, the engineering department, so to speak, is not really consulted. They're just told what to do. On the left, we see here the different supporting organizations, regardless whether they're from the finance side or they do commitments reporting support or their research or their uh, UN agency, etc. You have a vast array of different organizations, and I mean hundreds, all providing different ideas, perspectives, and programs, whether to policymakers, companies, within the companies, etc., or between themselves. And they have the issue that they provide a lot of assistance and advice, but because there's a lot of confusion out there, they have great difficulty in upscaling their successful projects. So what we end up having is we end up having uh, sustainable energy or energy efficiency policy that's ultimately based more on theory than real hard data from the ground. From an industry perspective or a company perspective, very often it's led by corporate management and therefore the sustainable energy strategy is kind of based on image, CSR, or even just minimum policy compliance. And as a result, we don't deliver the real potential on the ground within these different companies that we could be delivering upon. Now, what's also important to mention here is as a result of, we'll say, this various different confusion, we end up talking about all the successes we've had, but on a scope one and scope two level. That means the energy users uh, within, let's say, if it's a tier one or an OEM company, they can say they have a great um, energy efficiency project or program and they're achieving a lot, but ultimately the product that they're producing is most, the CO2 footprint of this product is mostly due to the supply chain and the scope three uh, emissions. And unfortunately, these are very often neglected in all the progress that we've done so far. So ultimately, due to this confusion, communication gaps, et cetera, we are actually neglecting one of the biggest issues, which is the supply chain. So an effective stakeholder engagement approach really 
should first talk about engagement within the companies, getting the message right between, let's say, the engineering divisions who implement the projects and the corporate management who develop the strategies. Also very important to have engagement between the companies themselves, so there's an exchange. Taking industry as a whole, we need to have a much more unified industry engagement with both policymakers and supporting organizations that understand the end user perspective. That means if I develop a policy, the end user of this policy must be taken into account when I actually develop it. If we take this kind of more unified approach, which is not just kind of a, a top-down with the end user, the engineering at the bottom line, and the supporting organizations in confusion, if we take a unified approach, what we ultimately have from the company perspective is strategies that are based on real potential and self-driven implementation based on a business case approach. From the supporting organizations, we'll have a much better in, uh, uptake of their existing programs. We'll have an improved replication of their successful pilot projects. And policy, most importantly, will be based on real project data and business reality. Now, what do we need to do to make this really happen? Ultimately, we need to change perceptions. Today, energy efficiency, sustainable energy as a whole, is considered an environmental obligation more often than not. The reality is we must change this perception from an obligation to a core business strategy. Energy efficiency, sustainable energy, makes sense. It's a, mod, it's, a, it's a form of modernizing how businesses work. It can be integrated into a core business strategy. It's a perception change that must happen to really uh, address this overall communication gap issue and to get a greater uptake of energy efficiency. So, in relation to this, going back to the mention I made of two projects that are being developed to make this happen. We have one project with UNECE, which is effectively this Industrial Energy Efficiency Task Force, which is focusing on making better use of resources that already exist. By this, what we mean is we want to provide better clarity, one, on what industrial energy efficiency is, how it interacts with other sustainable energy measures and what its non-energy business-oriented benefits are, and very importantly, enable companies to choose resources that are most suited to help them pursue energy efficiency in line with, say, their business and engineering strategies. Making sense of all the different supports that are out there provided by organizations such as NGOs, nonprofits, uh, UN agencies, etc. On the other side with UNIDO, this is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, who are already actively involved in the field implementing industrial energy efficiency projects in developing countries, we are developing or we have developed an industry working group. And the idea of this industry working group is that it is a B2B platform that um, specifically involves, we'll say, the energy end user perspective to both develop and share energy efficiency best practices with, let's say, the objectives of one, increasing widespread implementation by catalyzing and accelerating energy efficiency implementation actions by the companies themselves and to developing we'll say trans what we call transformative policies that means channeling the input and perspectives of the end user the energy end user to policymakers to improve policy effectiveness so if we have these two um, projects working together these projects will ultimately oh, sorry will ultimately, uh, let's say, on one side, make better use of the existing resources, connecting to all the different companies, will achieve all going well, more effective policy, and a widespread implementation, purely because we're taking the idea that the energy, energy end user perspective is key to any kind of discussion on energy efficiency, and making better use of the existing resources is much better than trying to create new projects, new programs, new initiatives. So in a way, what we are doing here is we are actually creating new projects, but the idea is, is to make better use of what already exists. Now, um, what's important maybe to mention quickly about the UNIDO Industry Working Group is we are going to focus mostly on working, mostly working with uh, large companies, international large companies on a group level. The idea being that if we can work with the large companies, we will also then ultimately have access to their supply chain. The idea is, is to work on a top-down, bottom-up scale. Using bottom-up, using the, let's say, the, um, 
technical expertise that we need on the ground, and the top down is engaging with large groups that have access to large supply chains. So to have the biggest impact. And the idea really is to do all this from a business case approach. There's a, we, energy efficiency does make business sense and we want to work with companies directly to demonstrate this and ultimately use this information that is input into transformative policies. So that's very briefly what we consider the challenge, saying again the communication gaps and also two projects which we hope will help overcome these communication gaps and achieve greater implementation of energy efficiency. So it's really all about connecting the dots and not trying to reinvent something new on the topic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hannes. That was great. Uh, very good to have different perspectives as well. Um, all right, so we'll now go on to um, the Q&As from our listeners. So thank you very much all for your presentations. I'll now unmute everyone and we'll get started with a few questions from, uh, from our listeners. So just to remind everyone, you can submit your questions via Twitter using hashtag CS Europe or you can use the go-to uh, the go-to web bar on the right of your screen. And um, so we've had a few questions already. Um, first, maybe I should start with Mark, as it was the first presentation. Um, we had a question on um, on you. You mentioned so renewable energy via self-generation and 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 some via some quality instruments. So someone was asking. What, what, what those instruments were and if you could expand a bit on it. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, so a few years back, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol uh, released some new guidance um, about how to report on the impact of renewable energy into your Scope 2 emissions. Uh, just to take a quick step back, so Scope 2 emissions, for anybody who's not familiar with them, are emissions that uh, result from consuming energy that's generated elsewhere. So think about uh, electricity being the most obvious example. Uh, you will have a power generation site located somewhere else in the country and you will be consuming electricity generated from that site. And so that would be an example of a scope two emission. So the guidance from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol uh, set out a range of quality criteria that your renewable energy must meet in order to be able to be uh, accounted for at zero carbon emissions or at reduced carbon emissions. And so these, these certificates or instruments are set out in the Greenhouse Gas Protocol um, guidance. So for example, in the UK, uh, there are uh, instruments called REGOs, so Renewable Energy Guarantees of Origin, which your energy supplier could uh, provide to you. Uh, in Europe, they are called just simply Guarantees of Origins. Uh, in the US, uh, they're called Renewable Energy Certificates. And so there are a range of different instruments that you can procure, which will, in effect, make your, renew your energy renewable and reduce your Scope 2 emissions, uh, at least your accounting of Scope 2 emissions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, and in terms of, I think that's something that actually the um, Emma and you mentioned during their presentations was the importance of, of um, data. So uh, there was a question about how to get started with collecting data and how, how does it work exactly in terms of, uh, yeah, collecting the data and then data management. If you could um, expand a bit more on this, uh, maybe Mark, you can start and Emma, you can add anything you, you want to add after. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I think the challenge with data in this area is for many organizations managing energy and carbon is a little bit of a new discipline and so whereas it's quite easy to get your hands on data that explain your financial transactions it's not always as straightforward to do that for um, for greenhouse gases and energy in particular so what we would typically do and, and with the RBS uh, example that we talked about uh, it begins with a process of really trying to understand what sources of data are available to them and for uh, sites that are meaningful, i.e. ones that consume a lot of energy, if the sources of data are perhaps not um, of a quality that we would ideally like, then we would typically look to uh, roll out uh, smart meters into those properties. And a smart meter will give you much more accurate energy data. Uh, usually at least every half an hour it will tell you what the consumption is and sometimes even more frequently than that. Um, I think really the process of designing a meter rollout is uh, a little complicated. 
probably worth working with people in your organization to really understand your energy and your portfolio to set in place uh, a really robust plan of action. And then, of course, you need somewhere to collect that data. Uh, you could use Excel spreadsheets, um, but if you have a large portfolio, that will quickly become difficult. And so there are uh, energy management tools available in the market uh, that you could buy and that you could use to give you better visualization of your data. Okay, interesting. Emma, did you have anything to add to that? No, I suppose the thing is to uh, work out what data you have first, what is available to you and what you can learn from that. And then to be very clever about what data you collect because just because you have data doesn't mean it's going to be any use to you. It's really important to collect the right data um, and at the right level for your organization. Mm. Emma, now that we are um, discussing, um, there were also some questions about the, um, you mentioned the size of, well, you mentioned in-house teams for energy. Mm -hmm. And um, so someone has asked um, to, uh, to, for, for you to expand sorry, a, a bit more about the general structure of the team, the main area, areas, positions, responsibilities, how, how, how can a company uh, kind of structure their energy team for it to be as efficient as possible? That's a very big question <laughs> um, because it really depends on the structure of the company itself. It depends on the support level that management gives to the, to the company um, and it depends on the size of the company. Um, most people will need one person directly in control of energy who needs to be at a level within the organization where they have some um, weight, I suppose, in terms of the spend and where they can spend and get in funding. They need then to have people who can work at the organizational level and to investigate uh, where energy is being sent to follow up on energy. And usually it's energy and utilities together. But even bigger organizations sometimes maybe have only one or two people working on energy, which is why often when one person leaves, a lot of the knowledge can go with them. Um, usually in energy, um, they will be doing energy and utilities at the same time. They will be doing a number of other jobs as well. Um, and while it might be nice, you're saying what's the, the, the best way to optimize your energy team, often the budget isn't there to have a large energy team on site, which is why something like a, getting external services that can work with you, like Mark's does or like ours does, can help in delivering energy savings. Um, and expanding your team from an external source. Actually, just to build on, on what Emma said, I think the situation in many large organizations now has uh, changed from perhaps 10 years ago, or maybe pre-financial crisis. Uh, lots of our clients used to have energy management functions, uh, sometimes quite robust ones. and over the uh, process of adjusting to post-financial crisis world, a lot of those companies downsized their organizations and quite often that energy management function disappeared as part of the, the, the transition process. So what that's left quite a lot of our um, clients with is a situation whereby the people who own the energy budgets uh, and probably have the responsibility for delivering savings on those budgets will have to seek to interact directly with perhaps facilities management contractors who are the hands and, uh, and, and feet on the ground. And the challenge is they very often lack energy efficiency or energy understanding in order to direct that facilities management action. And so really this is where the service that we have put together and probably quite similar to what, what Emma's organization does, we seek to plug that intelligence gap between the budget owners and the uh, people on the ground who actually make the saving. And I think it's quite effective, um, and, and certainly we found it to be quite effective. Yeah, I can reiterate that. I mean, we're a new organization, relatively speaking, but we, we've never lost a client, you know, so the service is obviously good, and it's something that people need once they get it. I just think enough people don't need, know that they need that type of service. Mm. Yeah, so actually that was uh, the next question is how can small businesses uh, kind of deal uh, if they don't have enough kind of budget for a uh, big in-house team? So I suppose they would be just seeking external help, like you mentioned, um, and, and working with external teams. Yeah, I, I think so. But also there are a lot of resources there, no matter what country you're in, there are an awful lot of resources out there from the um, national agencies um, where you can get help and support. There are... 
um, groups and organizations like the Large Industry Energy Network in Ireland um, that support businesses or like the organizations that Hannes is working with potentially um, that do support businesses as well. So you can get help from those as well. I think energy efficiency isn't just Hello? a one-person okay. thing. Sorry, I, I think we lost you for a second, but it's all good. Sorry, I was just saying, I think energy efficiency isn't down to, and renewable energy, which are really part of the same portfolio, they're not down to one person, they're down to a team that can be external, and it isn't, it, you know, you, you need to look outside of your organization as well. well Emma, we lost you again. Um, okay. I don't think, I, I think you're, you're back. Um, yeah, um, Hannes, maybe did you want to, to tell us a bit more about, so if, if um, I, you know, I'm a small business, I want to get started with kind of energy efficiency and implement things, so what, what are the first steps and how, how, do, you, how do, do the different organizations kind of help uh, those businesses uh, get started? Actually, um, uh, coming from a slightly different angle than Mark and Emma, one of the things that is very important is not just that not just that there's technical, let's say, internal expertise, but that also the management structure in a company, even if it's a small SME, understands energy efficiency better. So really, maybe one of the first steps for small companies is actually to get a form of training in understanding energy efficiency, the benefits of energy efficiency, and how to incorporate energy efficiency into their general let's say, accounting and business structure. Because this is one maybe mistake that is often made. It's, it's treated as a purely technical issue. And it's, you, it's assumed that there should be an energy manager that should look after this. Whereas the corporate side, and again, a corporate could just be a simple CEO or an operating officer or whatever, they have absolutely no understanding of it and don't feel they should. And in a way, perhaps one of the key steps is that the management team actually get the training to understand even the basics of energy efficiency. And this is something that is av available in many, many different countries. As Emma said, true energy agencies and other support organizations offered by the governments is that there is capacity building for companies to educate, even on a basic level, the, the, the management structure, the management team on it. Because without the commitment and without the engagement and understanding of the management team, it'll never really work. Energy managers will come and go, the information will come and go. It has to be a core element of the company to actually really have success. So maybe it is about really educating the overall company on energy efficiency, renewable energy, from top down and bottom up. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Mark, did you have anything to add? I, I think that's a really interesting point. I, I think for smaller organizations, perhaps one of the real difficulties is to find ways to finance perhaps capital projects that could be uh, employed to reduce energy consumption. Uh, however, I, I think if, uh, as Hannah says, if you've got an organization that understands energy efficiency and is committed to it, certainly there ought to be quite a lot of very low or no, no cost energy efficiency measures that companies can uh, take advantage of in the first instance. And it can often be as simple as just turning things off when the building's no longer in operation. Uh, you, you'd be, I think, probably surprised to find that even large companies we work with, with very sophisticated building management systems, still have problems turning things off when the building's not in use. And it can be for a variety of reasons, right? Sometimes the, the building management system was poorly configured in the beginning, and it's been like that since the building started operating. Um, but very often, even small companies with limited budgets can generate energy savings just by looking at whether or not they really need to be consuming energy at that time. Actually, if I can just add, I think what's, uh, just to build on what Mark said, because he makes an interesting point uh, with the, let's say, the, the simple solutions, ultimately behavior change is a, can really bring uh, great benefits. Um, and I think this is what Mark's alluding to as well. I mean, if we can achieve behavior change throughout a company, you don't need large capital projects to achieve savings, and it puts in place. And uh, I think uh, it, that comes back to the training again. Everybody needs to be in on the game if you want to bring about behavior change. It cannot just be one or two key people. It has to be part of the, the, of the business itself. It has to be an, a core element of the business itself to bring about that.
Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. And then I think the key thing about the behavior change, though, is that very often organizations will carry out some training or um, have a discussion about what to do differently and then think that the job is done. Yeah, the problem yeah. with anything like training or awareness raising like that, it has a relatively short half-life. So if an organization is really serious about embedding the change, they have to keep communicating about it. Uh, there's some old adage that so once you're sick of, of saying something, probably people have just about begun to hear you. Uh, so you just got to keep at it. One of the changes that I would see uh, recently in our own organization, you know, I know we work in the sector, but we asked our staff why they do what they do. And a huge number of them said that they were interested in changing things and in changing climate change. And that's a change as well in people that uh, they are interested in the bigger benefits of why things happen now and they are bigger interested in the bigger picture. And I think one of the things about energy efficiency is that the, it's not just the energy efficiency benefits that should be promoted or looked at, it's the benefits outside of energy efficiency as well. So often you'll get increased capacities you'll get, you'll see through the energy, you'll see where problems are and can be changed. Um, increasing staff morale, like I was saying, there are a lot of benefits to energy efficiency that aren't just the energy saving budget at the end of the, at the end of the day. Great, thank you very much um, for all for the, the answer to that question. Um, uh, Mark, there is a, there was a question about your presentation earlier. Um, regarding cost avoidance and cost savings uh, and how to differentiate between the two uh, when, it's, uh, when it comes to uh, energy efficiency? Hmm, very good question. I suppose in many ways I, I use the term a little bit interchangeably, um, to be honest. Uh, I, I wouldn't make a, a huge distinction between them. Perhaps it's something that um, uh, Emma or Hannah's might have more of a determined view. For me, with my with organizations that, that me and my team work with, we really are about trying to deliver bottom line savings. And uh, perhaps if, if we're pushed to categorize it, cost avoidance might be something like uh, doing a build validation process whereby we're actually managing to uh, make sure that they're not, clients are not spending money incorrectly. Uh, rather than typical energy efficiency, but I'd be interested to hear if there's a distinction that Emma and or Hannes would draw about those two points. Um, actually, what I would say is I think this is what creates a lot of confusion for a lot of companies, in fact, is that there isn't really um, a very specific definition for all these, let's say, terms or um, approaches. Um, and it does, I think it does create a little bit of confusion, but, but ultimately it is something that is very specific to each company. I think Mark already said this, you, you do take an approach that's different for each company. So whether it's cost avoidance or energy saving or something else, ultimately it is what suits the business of that company. Now, what I would like to say, and I think I, I, sh I should have actually mentioned before, in all of this, in terms of how to measure, um, we would say cost savings, let's just use one word here, um, and how to, 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 to measure this and how to take an approach. There, isn't, there is a systematic um, management system, an energy management system approach, which is used by typically large companies. It's an ISO 50001 uh, 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 management system. And it's very similar to the quality management system, 9001 in its approach. And what this management system does is it does actually set out certain definitions and certain approaches to take. Now, while there are other ways and other definitions on certain things out there, it is actually a very solid way to take to approach energy efficiency. And a reduced version of this energy management system can also be used for SMEs. It can be in a kind of a a much simplified version, but it does lay out how to measure savings, how to identify savings, how to uh, quantify savings, and in what way, and most importantly, how to adapt this to the actual business of the company. And this goes into both cost savings, but also performance measurements. How do I perform? How do I measure my actual uh, energy saving performance? Have I saved energy this year, or have I just reduced my output, which has reduced my energy consumption? So there is a lot of methodology to understand before you really tackle energy efficiency. Um, again, in terms of measurement, in terms of quanti quantifying savings, 
um, that needs to be understood, I think, before you really get into the uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy approach. And again, I suppose this comes back to capacity training, et cetera, as well. It's a large part of what we do with our organizations, and it's very important to them, is, uh, is ISO uh, 50001, and then also the measurement and verification. And it's based on, usually you will have a baseline of a year, and you will do a plus and minus of that, but it changes depending on the products that's being made, the amount of production, the weather can have an impact. So it is quite a complex thing to do, but once you get above a certain level, if you're to prove that the savings are there, it's really the only way of doing it. Great, thank you very much um, all for your answers. Um, so we have still a few questions, but we're running out of time now. So what I'll do is I'll uh, compile the questions and ask um, you to answer to them um, in written, and we can publish this on our website and on LinkedIn for our listeners to kind of have answers to the, the questions that were not answered. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, for attending this webinar and taking part in this webinar. And so just to remind you, um, you can register online for Corporate Energy Series Europe, which will be held in Paris on 21st and 22nd of May. You can register online on our website, corporateenergyseriesEU.com, with a special 10% discount with the code WEBINAR2. And so thank you very much all and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>